think about mental health problems, anguish that people might experience. And for you, the thing that triggered them to have a really bad experience, it might not have been that bad for you. It might have been a one or two because you've been through a lot. Your life has been really hard. Maybe you came out of poverty. Maybe you came out of trauma. And as a result of these things, you're kind of operating on a one through life. You're so blessed based off of where you came from. And you look at somebody else and they have it so easy. Their life is so good. And yet they're saying this is a 10. That's not a 10. They, don't, they have no idea what a 10 is. That's easy to think that. And what my challenge is for you is to think this. It's not your or my responsibility to rate somebody else's pain. Okay? It's not your job to rate somebody else's pain. If somebody's going through a trial, to them it might be a big one. To you it might be a small one. But I hope that we can appreciate that this series can be meaningful for all of us, uh, no matter where we find ourselves in the pain scale. Let's review what we've been working on the past few nights. First, we want to talk about uh, identity and what it means. Now there's a definition. We could talk about the qualities, beliefs, personality traits, appearance, and expression that characterize a person or group. We understand that that, we summarize that into this phrase. It's your sense of self, of, of who you are. It asks questions like, who am I and who are you? We understand in pop culture that people want to kind of blow us up into different aspects and then really value people that have this particular aspect. And so it's easy for us to kind of divide into different groups, maybe those that look a certain way or speak a certain language or act a certain way or have a certain thing. And if you don't have that thing or if your skin color is not like mine or if we don't, you don't have the money that I have or, or maybe you have all the money and I don't have it, whatever it may be, it's very easy for our culture to turn us into these groups that don't get along. But what we are trying to advocate is that if your identity is secure in Christ, it's like a house built on a rock. A secure, Jesus-centered identity is a strong foundation. And from that foundation, you can have pride in who you are based on your heritage, your language, your education. All of that, that, that stuff is great. And you can build a strong identity, but it must be founded on the rock of Jesus when we build an identity off of worldly things or off of part of just our fleshly body, and if that's our whole life, friend, that's like a sinking sand and your house will fall. So we're encouraging strong, Jesus-centered identities. Well, so what, you might say? That's a nice speech. What is it really about? How is this biblically relevant? So here's the point that I'm trying to make. Here's one of my big concerns. I'm, I'm deeply concerned about this for Christians as much as I am when I go to my therapy office and I do therapy with clients there. I'm concerned about it there too. But I'm concerned about it for a lot of us. If people allow something to define their identity, a couple things could happen. Their world can shatter if that thing is removed, or their world can be distorted because they see everything through the lens of that thing, right? I'll give you a couple examples. If your whole world is about a relationship, you know, uh, I'll just use one that's safe to talk about, boyfriend, girlfriend, right? So, so uh, let's say you're young, it's your first boyfriend or girlfriend, and they're your whole life. Oh, man, I just absolutely like them with all my heart, right? And then they break up with you, and you're devastated. I, they were my whole world. That thing was removed, and your identity is, you're kind of floating. Let's talk about this next one, where it's distorted. You want to know what's crazy to me? That somebody can make $50 million a year throwing a ball. And not only can they make $50 million a year throwing a ball, but because they throw a ball better than you, they're better than you. And they will go through life condescending others who can't throw a ball as well as them. The world is distorted because they see everything through the lens of throwing a ball. So here we are. Maybe it's a skill. 
Uh, a lot of us, I hate to maybe stereotype, but uh, men predominantly, women, you can join this bandwagon if you want to. A lot of men identify by their job. What do you do? It's like the first question we ask each other. Hey, my name is Jonathan. What do you do? Right? When we did the COVID shutdown, it was one of the most fascinating experiments of modern time because the government told millions of people, you're not essential, stay home. And for millions of us, we thought, what do you mean I'm not essential? What I do matters. You're telling me it doesn't matter? And there was, what, it, what, what do we call that? It was an identity crisis. Uh, like I said, there is relationships that sometimes we pour ourselves into it. That relationship is taken from us, and now we don't know who we are anymore. And maybe it's a status. If, uh, another fascinating study is how social media impacts the choices that we make. And uh, if, for example, I'm going to get 100 likes by posting my photo this way, if I'm going to get 110 likes if I post it going this way, well, then I better, not do, I better do it this way so I get more likes, right? Our identity is based on things beyond us. And yet when those things are removed, we find ourselves in crisis. Well, hopefully what we've accomplished the past few nights, first is to understand that this does matter. If Jesus teaches about identity, and he does, and if his teaching is doctrine, it is, then the doctrine of Christ includes how we view him, how we view self, how he views us. Identity does matter. Last night we talked about a Jesus-centered identity where we should be able to say something like, it is no longer I, but Christ who lives in me. I have denied self of being the Lord in my heart. I wish to take up my cross and follow Jesus. I'm a created being who's been adopted in the family of God. This is a strong Jesus-centered identity. And yet, what we'll study today, identity crisis, is about when something has happened that has shaken us to the core. And we thought we were strong, but now we're wondering, well, who am I? Because I thought I was one thing, and maybe I'm not. So if you're taking notes, first, we're going to talk about insecure attachment with God. Second, we're going to talk about fear and how it is a crisis instigator. And third, finally, we're going to confront unhealthy fear with a secure, Jesus-centered identity. So we'll take those things from last night. And sometimes if your foundation has crumbled, it's time to rebuild from the ground up and have a strong house that's centered on God. The first thing that we'll do is talk about an insecure attachment with God. And like I mentioned last night, I think it is important to remember that the Bible talks about our safe connection with God over and over and over again. And it uses that word safe at least eight different ways to express how we ought to feel about God. Now, there are other ways that we ought to feel about God, and we're going to talk about those tonight. Maybe you're already thinking of one. Maybe you're thinking about, well, I know we're supposed to feel safe, but aren't we also supposed to fear him? You're right, we are. And to fear God and to feel safe with God work together. They're not working against each other. What I wanted you to do last night was to meditate on these questions. The main question is, do you enjoy a secure bond with God? Do you enjoy a secure bond with your Christian family? And we use the same things that I might use with uh, doing some therapy work, doing attachment theory. Um, but I would ask questions like this to my clients, and I ask them to you right now about your relationship with God. Are you able to regulate your emotions properly? Do you have a healthy sense of trust? Are you comfortable being alone and with others? Can you communicate effectively? Do you have good coping and problem-solving skills? Are you comfortable with vulnerability and with intimacy. And I'll just give you one example of how this questions uh, have helped me better understand when people were struggling in their connection with God. I was talking with a young woman one time and uh, I was trying to comfort her from the scriptures. Uh, she, her father had walked out of her life and he was no longer a part of uh, her identity. And this was very hard on a teenager 
because she uh, wanted and craved to have this relationship with him. And so as I was talking to her, I said, you know, God is a father to the fatherless, is what the Psalms say. And so when we don't have a father, we can at least look to God as a father. And she said to me, when I hear that word father, that just makes me angry. And it kind of made me step back and think, well, I kind of don't know where to go because God calls himself our father many times. So how do I help someone who has a very negative view of dad? That, that's just a challenge. I'm not going to answer that. If you want to answer, come talk to me after uh, the worship service is over. I give that to you simply as a challenge. Again, it might be a 1 on the pain scale for you, but for somebody else it might be a 9 or a 10. And sometimes it's difficult when you get a 1 and a 10 together in the same conversation talking about something like that. We talked last night about attachment styles. Now this is... Um, from the world of psychology. This is not necessarily something found in the Bible, although I do believe that it's based on the scriptures. Let me give you an example. Do you know what the first thing was in the Bible that was called not good? It's Bible trivia time, right? I, it's probably something sinful, right? It's whenever uh, Adam and Eve fell in the garden. No, it's actually something was not good while the world was perfect. What's that? In Genesis chapter 2, now there's a pattern in Genesis 1. God creates and he says it's good. He creates, it's good. He creates, it's good. He creates man, it's good. And then in chapter 2, God observes man and he says it's not good. Fill in the blank. You know what it is? It's not good for man to be alone. That's attachment. Attachment is how we relate. It's how you relate with your parents. It's how you relate with your romantic partner. And then with your friendships. That's attachment. And God said, and I know some people say, well, he's talking about Adam there. But I think in general we can say it's not good for man to be alone. And so in your relationships, there are uh, the x-axis and the y-axis, right? Uh, in your relationships, sometimes we can have low anxiety and high anxiety. And that means whenever I'm with you, do I feel calm or do I feel really nervous? Am I, you know, easygoing because I trust you or maybe I'm, I'm super anxious because I, I don't know what's going to happen when we get together. But then there's also the y-axis of low avoidance to high avoidance. When we get together, can we talk about serious things <laughs> or am I going to avoid that because, uh, again, I just don't know how this conversation is going to go. Can I talk to you about uh, maybe our views on holidays? Nope, I don't want to talk about that, right? So do you get what I'm saying? That this is the axis that these things are, are built on, right? And so there's one way to be secure, and that's to have low anxiety and low avoidance. <laughs> but there's several ways to be insecure. And some of us are insecure in one way or another. And what I'd like to do now is show you how someone could have a secure an insecure relationship with God and with their Christian family. So this is just this is my theoretical conversation, right? So somebody who's who is secure, who feels safe, could make this observation about themselves. I'm unworthy. But Jesus is worthy. And I'm forgiven, and thus I'm made holy. We sing about this all the time. And so I feel safe with my Christian family to say something like, I am not a perfect man. And you're not a perfect man or woman. We feel comfortable saying that. Not everybody does. Let's look at some examples of it. Let's talk about somebody who is anxious. They might say something like, I'm unworthy, and I'm afraid God is constantly disappointed in me. I don't know if he'll let me into heaven. I know for a fact that Christians have that mindset. Everywhere I go, when I talk to people, there are those who are terrified. If Jesus came back today, I don't know if I'd make it. That's an anxious, insecure foundation. Those who are fearful or might say, I've been deeply hurt by people who are supposed to care about me. 
I can't trust. And I'm suspicious of others. Now, that's somebody who's maybe experienced trauma. Uh, somebody who's been betrayed. Not by God, but by somebody really important in their life. Maybe a parent. Maybe a, an ex-spouse. But as a result of what that person did, this person thinks, I can't have this with anyone. Well, what about the avoided person? You're unworthy? How weak. I would rather tough it out myself than admit weakness. And as I said this, as I preach it in places, this is a lot of our preaching brethren. And I'm a preacher, and I get to say that because I'm one of the gang. That's me. It's really easy for me to stand up here and maybe say it in front of a group, but if you give me one-on-one, -on -one, I'm probably going to be a lot less likely to talk from the heart about some of these things. I just don't want to. I'd rather put up a wall and not talk about it. So I give this to you as an example. Bear with me for just a couple more minutes, and then we'll bring up the Bible, because that's what we're here for, right? We're not just here for a therapy lesson. This is a worksheet that I use with couples that come into my office. Please disregard the yellow arrows uh, and pretend like it's a blank worksheet. Now, filling out this worksheet takes me anywhere from two to four months. And so what you're getting is a lot of conversations with client families. Now, I am making this up. This, is not, this does not represent a real person, but it does represent uh, things that are very real. And what I have happened, had happened many times is people in the audience go, ooh, is he talking about me? And it's possible that I am. Uh, but I didn't do it because I know you, and now I'm calling you out in front of the church. So let me explain how I use this worksheet, and then we'll fill it out together. Again, please pretend like these aren't there yet, and pretend like you don't see this yet. It's a blank worksheet. This cycle is two people, and that's the way attachment works. It takes two people to make a relationship. You've got person A and person B. It could be a parent-child. Uh, I typically work with married couples or uh, uh, partners, and so I uh, usually it's a, a husband and a wife, and uh, so that's who we're talking about. Each person gets four squares. Person A gets these four, person B gets those four. This dotted line right here through the middle, this is all the things below the surface that we can't see, that we don't talk about. This is all the things above the surface that we can see, and usually, that's where we start filling out the worksheet because that's where people can talk. And they'll say things like, he always cusses me out when he gets mad. And so I'll go over to behaviors and I'll write uh, cusses when angry, right? And uh, maybe she is the one who's, uh, she just nags at me all the time. I can't do anything right. Nags when he can't do anything right. And so I'm just across the conversations, we're filling these out. And now what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to show you the things below the surface that, again, it took several sessions for us to get to this point. But let's say that this person, uh, deep down, their attachment wound, the thing that has broken them, maybe from childhood with a parent or maybe in their romantic relationship, something has cut them deep. And this person, for example, they've been cut deep with this wound that says, I don't deserve to be loved. Now, rare does anybody ever say that. We just have to kind of coax it out session after session until I might be the one that says, do you feel like you're worthy of being loved? No, no, no. They'll start crying. No, I'm not. I'm not worthy of being loved. Oh, how does that make you feel? The therapist's favorite question. Right? How does that make you feel? And they'll say, I feel a lot of shame. Tremendous shame. I don't deserve to be loved, so I have a lot of shame. I have a lot of fear. These are called primary emotions. We, we rarely, if ever, speak from this depth in our relationships. And I am speaking broadly. I know some of you may do that. Some of you are secure, and so you speak this way naturally. Well, if I were to ask you, how does that make you feel, they wouldn't say that. What they would say is something like this. I feel frustrated. That's like the number one emotion I get as a therapist. I'm frustrated. Frustrated? What do you, what's, what's frustration look like? Well, 
itch. It makes me grit my teeth. Oh, anger. And so we'll, we'll talk about anger, right? Well, what does that make you do whenever you get mad? And they'll say, well, I, I do yell and I do cuss. Now, this is one person and it's an example of it. And friends, I'm going to tell you something. Just because you're in the church doesn't mean that you always have great behaviors. I work with Christians who have trouble holding their tongue, who have trouble not intimidating their partner, who have trouble not stinging with words of venom at the person they're supposed to love. Notice now this arrow, this yellow arrow, and notice that the behaviors, where, what do they directly affect? The attachment. The behavior, we think it, it goes just behavior back and forth, ping pong, ping pong, but it doesn't. According to attachment theory, that is directly feeding whatever attachment issue this person has. And I couldn't make my little red box work all the way down. Oh, maybe it does. But this person in this hypothetical scenario has this big injury of, I'm a fraud, I'm fake, I'm a bad mother, I'm a bad wife, uh, I don't know what I'm doing, everybody else has got it figured out, I don't. So we're, we're painting a very broad picture here, but this idea of I'm a fraud, it's really, I hate using the word interesting, people think I'm crazy, but it's interesting whenever I will say that to them. Do you think you're a phony? And they'll go, oh, yes! And I'll go, mm. Sound, sounds like you're fake. <sighs> they can't believe that somebody's actually saying it. Why? Because this is, we don't talk about this stuff. Now this person who says they're fake, um, I ask them, what is driving this? What's motivating it? And eventually we get to fear. Oh, did you notice it's there on both sides? Fear. That's important for the Bible. We'll talk about fear in a minute. And you know what? That fear, because they're afraid that they're a fraud and, and they don't want anybody to know that, they get really defensive whenever uh, they feel out of control. Maybe they get overwhelmed and they start to shut down and get clammy. And as a result, they start stonewalling their partner. That's the word we use in therapy, stonewall. I'm putting up these imaginary bricks because I don't want to talk to you anymore. I'm going to shut this down and I'd rather walk away. Now... Uh, 85, if I can remember my percentages correctly, I'm probably not correct, but 85% of relationships where stonewalling occurs is men who stonewall to women. And there's a really interesting reason why. It's not because women are better arguers, and so men, we're just, I don't want to talk anymore because you always beat me every time. But we think that. But at the heart, way down deep, is I'm afraid and I'm afraid I might hurt you, and so I'm going to shut this down and protect you. Now, that might sound like really you know, Freudian or whatever, but that's behind a lot of stonewalling. But what's interesting is he's trying to protect her. He's trying to shut this down because he doesn't want to get out of control. But look what, look what it's affecting. It's not affecting her behavior. It's affecting her attachment. And so she already doesn't feel deserved, uh, or she doesn't feel like she deserves to be loved, and now he's not talking to her anymore, and so it's stinging that wound. Well, now I really don't feel loved. And what do you think happens? Now I really don't feel loved, so now I'm going to yell even louder. Well, I'm even, a, I'm even a bigger fraud. I can't, we can't even have a decent conversation. i got to shut this down. And it just spirals out of control. This is insecure attachment in a relationship. <coughs> and friends, I know that we don't have a relationship like this with God per se, but I believe that if you are insecure, that it's hard to pray to God. It's hard to read His Word. It's hard to worship in spirit and truth because there are things below the surface that you haven't put into words that are a challenge to do so with God. Jonathan, please connect this to the Bible and stop playing therapist. Okay, I'll do that. Let's get the Bible involved because this, is, this ought to be bigger than just me sharing therapy tidbits with you. I don't know if you knew this or not, but the most repeated command 
or command concept in the Bible is do not be afraid. 302 times the Bible says fear not, do not be afraid, 33, be anxious for nothing is one, do not fear, 66, do not worry, 24, do not be dismayed, 99. There is nothing mentioned in the scriptures more as a command concept than don't be afraid, do not fear. Why do you think that is? Is this just random? You think it's just that the Holy Spirit was saying this for no reason at all? course it's not random. Fear causes an identity crisis of eroding a secure bond with God. You have this strong Jesus-centered identity. I am who you say that I am. I'm so grateful that I'm in this family. I'm adopted. I'm an heir. And then suddenly fear comes into your life and you start to question whether or not you belong. How everybody else has it together, you don't. How everyone else's life is going well and yours isn't. And that little drip, drip, drip on the rock of your foundation will crack it and crumble it. Fear causes identity crisis. So I want to talk about that for secondly. Uh, fear, the crisis instigator. Why is fear so bad? Well, I think we could just summarize it this way. Fear deceives the mind. Every single one of you at one time was a little kid. And every single one of you had some irrational fear. I could not go upstairs in this farmhouse we lived in in Indiana because I saw one of those Ernest movies. I don't know if y'all saw those Ernest movies when you were growing up, but there's one where he has to fight trolls. Most trolls were so scary. I could never go upstairs. It's an irrational fear. Fear deceives the mind. Fear corrodes identity. Fear motivates selfishness. It motivates self-centered Actions. This is why it's so bad. But here's a question as well. Is it always bad? Some of you probably were thinking of the scriptures that I'm thinking of. Because I thought the fear of the Lord was the beginning of wisdom. Right? So how can fear be so bad and yet we're supposed to fear God? Well, there are four types of fear. And you know what? I put an asterisk on four because I'm, maybe I missed one. I'm very open to hearing from you if you feel like uh, there's the fifth level of fear that I haven't reached. So let's talk about these real quick. We've got godly fear, ungodly fear, sudden fear, and then what, what I'm going to call fear disorders. And uh, I describe godly fear as based on truth, and it keeps us from sin. That's a good thing. It's a good thing to have godly fear. Ungodly fear is based on lies. And it leads you to sin. That's the one we want to avoid. Sudden fears uh, are an immediate response to an external factor. It's not necessarily moral. It's just, whoo, you got startled in the moment. We can, however, react in godly and ungodly ways. I really wish Marissa's here because she gets to defend herself when she is here. But she's not. She's not feeling too well. She's at home resting tonight. So you get to hear my side of the story and believe it. Don't talk to her about it. I'm just believe my side. When we got married, Marissa had this, this uh, sick and twisted enjoyment of scaring me whenever I would come out of the bathroom or walk down the hall, right? And all she would do is she would wait around the corner like this, and I would just casually walk around the hall, and she'd go, eh, that's it. Nothing big, just eh. And it'd make me, ah! and I would just, you know, scream, shout. And after being harassed in my own home for who knows how long, I got so mad at her. Justice was swift. That's all I'll say. But I told her, you are not allowed to scare me in my house yet. It is against the law. I forbid it. As a man of the house, I will not be scared. And so that's a sudden fear. Now, that's a silly story. Obviously, an ungodly way to respond to that would be that if I lost my temper and started cussing at her or being abusive, that would be ungodly. But the, the actual fear itself, there's nothing moral about going, oh, whenever you get scared in your own house. Okay, uh, we won't talk much about fear disorders, but I at least want to mention them, that sometimes people have a mental or chemical imbalance in the brain in the same way that you could be born with uh, a deformity, 
Uh, maybe this, there's a, an arm or a leg, a hand or a foot that's, that's not formed properly. Sometimes the brain wasn't formed properly. And there's a chemical imbalance. And it's not moral. And it's important for us to, to honor and recognize that when somebody is not able to take care of their own faculties, that, uh, that we're not going to hold them accountable to that. It's also important to know that when it's within our control, that we ought to react in godly and ungodly ways. Well, I want to share scriptures with you because this has to be a Bible-based sermon. I'm not interested in just sharing my think-sos. So bear with me as we consider these verses. For godly fear, Deuteronomy 10, verse 12. Now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God and walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul? Proverbs 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Luke 12, verse 5. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him, that's God, after, uh, who after he is killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. And so the summary of the godly fear is a healthy respect and awe of God that takes root in the heart and rules the life. Brother Jeff has heard this story probably two times, maybe five, I don't know. But uh, it will be with me for the rest of my life. He's helped me wire multiple houses that I've either owned or rented out and will... Uh, pull off the panel and I remember one time we pulled off the electric panel we got everything out of the way and it was the big old fat copper wires that's coming in from the pole outside and he said Jonathan do not touch it you will die and I remember looking at that thinking I do not want to touch it I do not want to die now did we did we tear out all the electricity and say I won't have any of that in my house because I don't want to die of course not we had a very healthy sense of respect for the power that's coming in. And so it is with God. You ought to fear Him because God will judge all of us on the day. So we should respect and have awe for His wonderful power. Ungodly fear, the things that I have been talking to you about with attachment stuff, it's based on lies, and yes, it does lead to sin. And so while I might be working on this with couples in a, a therapeutic setting, uh, my heart goes out to them because this type of fear leads to ungodly actions, like yelling and cussing, like abusing, and uh, not loving and respecting the way the Bible calls us to do so. Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Romans 8, 15. For you do not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption. The sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. 1 John 4, 18, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. So the summary is an unhealthy sense of dread, worry, and anxiety that takes root in the heart and rules our lives. Have you ever heard the scripture where it says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, make your request known to God. Sometimes we use that scriptures to say, you should never worry, like never, zero. I'm going to go ahead and front load by telling you, I don't think that's what that scripture is teaching. What I do think that scripture is teaching is an unhealthy sense of dread, worry, and anxiety that takes root in the heart and rules the life. Very quickly. Sudden fears, there are these examples in scriptures. I'll just uh, mention them. Genesis 32, Psalm 56, Matthew 28 are examples of sudden fears. Although Matthew 28 is a great example of people having a godly and ungodly reaction, the women had a godly reaction. They were afraid, but then they ran off and told the truth. The soldiers were afraid. They ran off and told a lie. So that's how sudden fear may work. So it's an immediate reaction to something outside that causes a fear response. And there's, again, uh, so much to say about fear disorders. For the sake of time, I will move on. So what? That may be where you're at right now. There's Taco Bell in the back. Jonathan, please hurry so we can eat it. Well, here is what I want you to consider. I shared this image with you on the first night but I'm bringing the opposite of it because both of these are true. Fear warps our identity. Sometimes God has blessed us with abilities and gifts 
And fear warps our identity where we think that we're absolutely worthless. And we need to change. Sometimes we are so warped in our identity that we think we're something great. And we need to repent. We need to humble ourselves. Fear warps the identity. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and sound mind. And so for the third and final part of our study tonight, we're going to confront this unhealthy, ungodly fear with a secure, Jesus-centered identity. And I want to call you back. If anything that I have said resonates with you about maybe you're anxious about the Lord, maybe you've had trauma and it's hard to trust, maybe you're an avoider and you would rather just do it all yourself and not be a burden to anyone else. These insecure identities can change. I want to tell you something about the research of Dr. John Bowlby and attachment theory. According to his research, one can move from insecurity to security. It is possible for one to build security. We're going to talk about that some tomorrow. For tonight, I want to say this. The same apostle who wrote Philippians 4, verse 6, where it says, Be anxious for nothing. He also wrote this in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 5. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. In 2 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight, And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. But I'm afraid. That as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Did Paul contradict himself? He commanded us to not worry, but then he worried all the time? No. Because Paul had a secure base of which he could worry. What did he worry about? Well, when you have the word fear in the Bible, we understand that the, the negative, the ungodly type, is a lifestyle of surrender to dread. Does that sound like Paul to you? It does it to me. And that's what he's telling us to avoid in Philippians. Don't have a life where you're only drowning in dread and sorrow. Is it okay to have concern about God's ways and God's people? Yes, that sounds a lot like Paul. He was worried. He was anxious. Is it okay to have distress over bodily harm or mental harm? Yes, that also sounds a lot like Paul, whose life was put on the line many times. And friends, it's okay to worry whenever you're worried about good things. It's okay to worry when you're in harm's way. That's your body's natural defense. Let me tell you, I know I've gone long tonight, and I'm not even done yet. But let me tell you this, moms, Dads, too, if you think anxiety is bad, like all the time, I want to measure your heart rate as you watch your child who has just learned to walk, walk out into the street. And if you're able to stay calm with a perfect heartbeat that's the same as it was, and that little one-year-old is walking out in the street, and you hear the gunning of an engine down the road, if you don't get anxious for that child's safety, I'm going to wonder whether or not you're alive. God gives us anxiety for a reason. God does not want us to wallow in a lifestyle of anxiety. But he wants us to protect ourselves and he wants us to protect his people. And sometimes that red flag that goes off, why am I feeling? Why am I anxious? Because I have concern for others. Because I'm worried about my safety. That's the big difference. Okay, four things, and then I'll offer the gospel invitation. Four ways to help rebuild a secure, Jesus-centered identity. Number one, godly fear is a part of a secure, Jesus-centered identity. You ought to be afraid if you are in sin. If you are living wrong, I don't want you to walk away from this message tonight thinking, oh, Jonathan just wants me to feel good. No. I want you to be right with God. 
And godly fear is at the start of a strong foundation. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10 and 11, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. You know what that means? A secure relationship with God. I don't regret it. I don't regret anything. I am safe. I'm secure. Whereas the worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourself, what indignation, what fear. Fear. It's a good thing. What longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you prove yourself innocent in the matter. And so godly fear is a part of it. And I challenge you that if you don't fear God, don't expect to have a secure base with God. Number two, contentment is a part of a secure, Jesus-centered identity. Being at peace with who you are and what you have. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me for the sake of of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. A Jesus-centered identity means when I look at you and you've got it all together, and in my heart there is a hurricane going on, I'm not jealous that you have it all together. I'm thankful. And I want that for me. So I'll be content, thankful that you have it, I'll want it, and I'll be content with my weaknesses knowing that if I can get off the throne of my heart, then Jesus can get on that throne. Number three, comforting others is part of a secure, Jesus-centered identity. For these three sermons, I've really been focusing on you. <coughs> but did you know that research suggests that when you are others-focused, you are more content? Did you know that? That's not just the Bible. That's the social scientists who go out and do research for questions that we already all knew the answer to, but they still do the research anyway. And then they confirm it. That's great. First, let's read the Bible. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction. So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. What do you think the key word is there? Comfort. If you were taking notes, I hope you'll look back on the scriptures for this point, and all of them have been from 2 Corinthians so far. This is a book about affliction and comfort. You know what, you know what Paul calls affliction? Fightings without, fears within. That's how he identifies it. Now, the research, here's an article, for example. Uh, the title of this article says, Do unto others or treat yourself. The effects of pro-social and self-focused behavior on psychological flourishing. And do you know what the research indicates? If you are only self-focused, you are not as happy as if you are others-focused. And here's my warning. Now, I'm in the mental health business, and several of my colleagues in that line of work uh, advocate for self-care above all else. I, as well, advocate for self-care, meaning if you can't take care of yourself, how will you take care of others? My concern with a self-care-first mentality is that when you're on the throne of your heart, and it's all about me, 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 Self-care turns into selfishness real quick. If we have an others-focused mindset of, I have been comforted by God, I can comfort someone who's gone through this. You're actually going to, research says you'll be happier if you do that. And I know in the churches of Christ, we do not have a um, custom of testimony sharing. And, and I think for a good reason. I think sometimes in that, and this is Jonathan, you know, from the book of Opinions, chapter 1, verse 1, but in that testimony 
culture that, that some denominations practice, it becomes very self-focused. Look how great I am. Well, look what I overcame. And so Churches of Christ have rightly said that's not going to be part of our worship service. What I think we miss out on by not talking about it privately, however, is the ability to comfort each other. How do I know how to comfort you if I don't know what you're going through or what you've overcome? How do I know how to overcome if, if I don't know that you overcame it yourself? Please come back tomorrow as we build a culture of confession. That's the sermon, building a culture of confession. We don't have a testimonial time in our worship where one person gets up and shares their testimony, but we ought to, in private, we ought to be able to say, Wesley, let's go get coffee. I have a victory that I want to tell you about. I, I did it. We ought to be able to say, I've been sober for a month. I just, in closing announcements, I've, I've been sober for a month. Thank you all for your prayers. I ought to be able to say, I messed up. I've been doing really well. I fell off the bandwagon. Can you pray for me so that I can get back on? That's the type of stuff that we ought to be doing to each other. Others focused. Number four, and finally, a secure Jesus-centered identity includes talking to loved ones about fears. Again, I'm front-loading for tomorrow's sermon. But James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Therefore confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. This is a one another command. You will confess. You will listen. You don't just do one or the other. You have to do both in order for the command to be obeyed. I have spent uh, more than my fair share of time talking to you tonight, but I hope that these four strategies of respecting God, having contentment, even in the midst of a storm, you can still have contentment. You can comfort others in their distress, and you ought to talk to a loved one. Listen, um, that stuff that's below the surface, talking about fears, talking about attachment wounds, I don't know what word I could use to describe it, but in the therapy room, when people get comfortable enough, usually at month two or three, when they get comfortable enough to actually be vulnerable with each other, it is an amazing experience. And I've seen some pretty rough dudes and some pretty rough gals who I never would have thought could speak that deeply from the heart. And I'll tell them, you're talking to me about each other. Please turn and talk to each other. I want you to take hands. I want you to look into your eyes. And I want you to tell her what you just told me. And so they'll take hands. And they'll look at each other. They'll smile because it's really awkward that they're about to do this in front of a stranger. right? And they'll look at each other. And one will say, and maybe they'll look off. And they'll look back and they'll say, you know how my mom and dad, I just felt like they never loved me. And I was totally abandoned. I've been on my own since I was 16. Every time you yell at me, I just feel like I'm on my own all over again. And when they say something like that, and then the water works, like all three of us are like <laughs> crying in session together. Not me, though. I never cry. It's amazing. And it ought not take a piece of paper on the wall that says therapist for that to happen. What ought to happen is that God's people who have a strong Jesus-centered identity are able to do these things together. So husbands, wives, parents, children, friends among this congregation, find a loved one to talk to. Tomorrow, you've got to come back because I'm going to teach you how to have that vulnerable conversation. But if you don't come back, it may be that you try and it just goes off the deep end. Let's do it together. Let's go on the shallow end starting tomorrow. It's time to offer the invitation. And so in the same way that I've done the last three nights, I'm going to make these three statements to you. Number one, Jesus cares about the way we view him. He does not want us to simply see him as a nice teacher. He wants us to be, uh, he wants us to view him as Lord and Messiah, as Savior and Son of God. Your identity 
according to James 1, 23 through 25, your identity is secure when you're obeying God. Not simply that you're listening or hearing, but that you're obeying Him. And finally, your identity really is complete in Christ. If you would but submit to Him, and maybe there's a lot of hurt, a lot of trauma, maybe there's a lot of pride, a lot of anger, if you would but relinquish control of your heart and give it to the Lord, you will find, in fact, that you are complete in Christ. We don't want to close without offering a gospel invitation. If somebody would like to become a Christian, we want you to know that if you follow the same New Testament plan that people have been following for the past 2,000 years, and that is to have faith in the Son of God, and by His grace, thank you, God. By His grace, if you would come hearing and believing repenting of your sins, confessing that Jesus is the Son of God and be baptized for the remission of sins, calling on the name of the Lord, that you too can have a firm foundation to build a life off of. Friends, if you have uh, sin in your life as a Christian and you would like to have prayer for that, then confession for that, we'll invite you to come forward now as we stand and sing a song. 915, first, second, and last.